Okay, it is now time for us to dive deep again into an exploration of power. I am going to be introducing the moderator of our next panel, um, and then we're going to go deep. Maya Wiley is counsel to the mayor of the city of New York. Amongst the hats she wears, she is also part of his senior cabinet. Um, as she comes up here, I'm going to tell you the rest of her bio is in the app. It's on the website. Um, but Maya is going to come up and introduce this panel, and I hope that you find this engaging as we did yesterday. Um, I uh, heard at the hotel someone said, oh yeah, we're, we're so glad to hear you're here, Maya, because um, you're not doing this anymore. You're like not doing this work anymore. And I was like, um, mm, but I actually am still doing all the same work I was doing before I became Mayor Bill de Blasio's counsel. I'm just doing it in government now. And um, I say that, so I'm not dead, y'all. I'm still here. Um, and, and because I, as we talk about, I was given the, the, the very easy, small task of talking about race, class, and power in 12 minutes. <laughs> so, race, class, and power in 12 minutes is like speed dating. But what I'm really going to focus on a lot is both how I think we have to challenge ourselves to think differently about power, maybe differently, maybe it won't be different for all of us, um, and actually pose some really tough questions to ourselves, but in a way that does not confuse us about the fact that we actually have power. So, so how do we define power? And they're, they're really, if you ever Google this, because Google's a verb now, um, you will find many definitions of power. In the context of organizing, we usually hear power is the ability to act. Right? How many people agree with that definition? Raise your hand. OK, a lot of people. I certainly agree that this is one form of power, right, and, and an important form of power. Um, but I'm going to go do something that no one should do at 9.20 in the morning on a Wednesday morning on four hours of sleep. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Foucault. <laughs> um, so, you know, what Michel Foucault said, which was so important, is power is everywhere. Power is everything. Um, and I actually think that this is the way we have to challenge our notion of power. Because the act, to act, is simply one form that many forms of power take. Um, and the reason I think it's relation, it's production, um, it's diffuse. Uh, he actually talks a lot about a structural approach to power and, you know, so really I think this is more what power looks like. Um, power is not linear. Power is not singular. Uh, by definition, there are multiple forms. It's interactive. It's not within any lines. It comes. It goes. Uh, it feeds. It's not just an action. It's also an, inf it's an, an influencer. It's not just oppression. It is also production. It is not a negative. It is a positive. And it is a negative. And it is a positive. It depends. Sometimes we, in acting our power, are actually, with all the right intentions, doing negative. With all the right intentions. And sometimes, with all the wrong intentions, we sometimes do some good stuff. Even though we didn't intend to do some good stuff. Um, and I'm using that as a broad we. But the point is that if we're really challenging ourselves on this notion of power, particularly as it relates to race, class, community, um, we're not talking, we should not be using the singular in any respect. We must be using the plural. Uh, and we must be challenging ourselves to think about power strategically. So we often talk about bottom up versus top down. I think Michel Foucault explodes this too. Uh, and I would like to explode it. Because the reality is power and the power that is, the powers that are diffuse that we have the ability to utilize, to interact with, to create, to discourse around, is actually not one or the other. 
It is greatly interactive. It produces multiple different forms of power in and of itself as a, as, as a form of relation. Uh, and one of the things I think we need to do, those of us who think very much about how we, how we support and reconstitute a racially just, socially just, equitable society, particularly as it lives in our communities, have to stop the top, top, top down, bottom up dichotomy. We simply have to. For the first time in this country, we actually have, in a number of our major cities, progressive leadership. OK? Uh, I wouldn't be in city government if we didn't have progressive leadership, quite frankly. I never thought I was going to be in city government. If you would ask me two weeks before Mayor Bill de Blasio called me up, OK, he didn't call me up personally. But it makes a better story if I say he called me personally. <laughs> when his office called and said, the mayor wants to see you, I laughed out loud, told my family I'd be back in an hour, because that's all it would take for him and I both to sit down, have a discussion, like each other, and realize that I would find ways on the outside to support some of what he was doing on the inside, right? Um, it didn't take long before I realized, uh, and on the outside, we were already, the Center for Social Inclusion, the organization I founded and ran, were already starting to work increasingly with city governments. And for some of you, as you know, under its new leadership, CSI has done that now on steroids with a number of you in this room and others. Uh, it is because for the first time, one, we're not getting shit done in DC. Uh, we're getting some things done. Power is complicated. But it is a primary locus for innovation, but it's also a primary locus of power, of many of the forms of power that are multiple that we need to leverage. Um, but if it's not just top down or bottom up, then the question becomes, how do we understand, even the inside outside game conversation, I think is even the wrong language. I mean, we have to form different forms of relationship to all our various forms of power, but also all the ways in which power can be constituted and reconstituted. Um, so, <laughs> I'm saying, so think about this way. And I'm going to go back to the Civil Rights Movement, mostly because that's my own locus of history. There are multiple different contexts that anyone can draw from for this. But even if you just think of power in the context of the Civil Rights Movement, right? Not a lot of what we would typically call top-down power, right? Not power in government, necessarily. I mean, some allies, certainly, but not at very large, great level. Um, this is a form of power, right? A, 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 these, are, these four young men are the young men in, in, who, in Greensboro, North Carolina, who took it upon themselves. Nobody told them to go to the Woolworth lunch counter. They took it upon themselves one year after the Montgomery bus boycott, which obviously was highly organized by a wide variety of people, uh, including a wealthy donor in New York City who was white, right? Multiple forms of powers and relation. Uh, they took it upon themselves and fomented a next level of movement in the civil rights movement. This is a form of power, uh, and it was a critical form of power. This was also a form of power, right? The freedom schools. Uh, one of the things that Foucault says about powers is that he talks about power knowledge. Now, he does not mean that in a linear sense. It's not just information is power. In fact, he would deny that. He would explode that. But his point is the process of creation of power has multiple forms. Knowledge and the discussion of knowledge and the, and he would say truth is not an absolute, right? We're constantly reformulating our truths. If you think about this, freedom schools were one way in which it was both a challenge and a resistance to people who are black in the South in particular not being able to learn, not being able to become registered to vote, but it was also uh, a form of a collective development of knowledge that in and of itself is a form of power. Um, and then the other example, of course, is the more collective that finds other mechanisms for impacting the public discourse. Because Foucault also talks about power as discursive, right? The development of our truths are often about how we develop our pathways to understanding what we collectively think truth is. Race and class 
are things we're constantly and still in this country talking about badly, inaccurately often. And what is accuracy, right? I mean, part of the definition of power is the ability to shape our collective understandings of what these things are. And in fact, race and class are not dichotomous. And they can't be understood separate from one another. We can't even understand how we have constituted communities and why our communities look the way they do, including racial segregation, including criminalization, including the lack of affordable housing, including the lack of health care access, environmental degradations, all the things that I'm sure everyone in this room is trying to tackle without actually understanding that we fundamentally have a concept of race and class in this country that is ill-formed and inaccurate, and certainly inaccurate by our own, many of our own lived experiences. We could add sexuality into this, gender identity. I just have 12 minutes. Uh, but, but there are other forms of resistance, right? And there are other forms of resistance that took place in the civil rights movement. I would argue this is a form of power. It's one form of power. I would argue it was a form of power that was not the most successful. Uh, and in part because in creating a new collective, part of the way we need to see multiple powers is how we actually interact together to create a much, much more robust set of understandings, set of knowledges, set of powers that is not only oppositional. Um, so in closing, because I have one minute left of my 12-minute dance, uh, I, what I would say is remember that as we go through this conversation of power, there, there, this is just a few that uh, Michel Foucault lists. Um, you know, we, government actually is usually sovereign, pastoral, disciplinary, power knowledge, but government does not create these things by itself. In fact, often government itself is constrained by larger forces that have shaped what is sovereign, what is discipline, what is helping people move from point A to point B on public transportation. There are so many different forms of institutions that even impact. This is why the top down doesn't really work, right? Because the constraints, we all are experiencing different forms of constraint as well as different forms of pathway in this relationship of multiple powers. And what I have seen, and I'll talk about it more on the panel, but what I have seen now having been on the government side of the fence is a deep, 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 deeply troubling lack of capacity for us to really work in a true form of powers that are collective that are not just top down or bottom up, that recognize the tools and the opportunities to actually get substantial amounts of social justice done if we do it together. Thank you.